You guys all set to go back there? Cool. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, so my name is Nick Leghorn. This is IDS Configuration for Beginners. A um, little background. Uh, graduated from Penn State in 2010. God, that was a while ago. Um, <laughs> found the Penn State 2600 out there. Um, since then, I worked for Rackspace, which I know is kind of a small corporation here in Austin, or San Antonio. Um, worked for Shortel, worked for Mitel. I've done more IDS deployments than I can remember in my lifetime. Um, it's been a great private pilot. Uh, and now, since I've done all those IDS deployments and installations, I work with my coworkers up there. We founded a company called NetTech Solutions that does IDS deployments, network configuration, that sort of thing. So my, I, my point today is I'm, I'm here to show you configuring an IDS actually is not that hard. Um, there's a lot of tools out there that are really simple and will get you pretty much all the way there with maybe six commands. All you gotta know is how to configure it and how you want it to run. So I'm gonna talk through um, the deployment model, where it's supposed to be in the network in order to get the best use out of it, um, what it does, uh, how to set it up. We'll do a live configuration here in a couple minutes. Uh, and then at the end, we'll talk about what are the next steps. How do, we, how do we get the alerts out? How do we analyze the alerts? What do we do next? So what, what is an IDS and why do we need one? So if you take a look at this, this is a, a pretty typical um, network configuration. right? You've got a firewall, you've got a couple segments off of it. Um, maybe your users are on one segment, public facing servers on another, internal private facing servers on a different one. Um, and the firewall does a good job of segmenting off that traffic. So only things that you want to flow between the segments flow between the segments. So maybe HTTP goes to the public facing servers and uh, Samba or SMB goes to the private facing servers and, and there's file sharing going on and the fi firewall is doing a pretty good job of managing that. But how do you know that traffic is good? There can be a lot of malicious things hiding within that traffic. Uh, brute force attacks, uh, SSH credential uh, attacks. There could be things that your firewall isn't picking up on. And a firewall is a good start, but it doesn't really have all the functionality that you want built into it. So like I said, a traditional firewall will, will segment that off. You can tell it, I don't want SSH going over here, I want FTP going over here. It's kind of like, I, I like to think of it as that border guard at uh, a military base, right? You can check, okay, your, every truck that comes into the base, you've got a manifest, it says only red trucks come in today. Cool. So it checks, sees the truck is red, and it comes. It doesn't actually see what's inside the truck. It just checks that the outside of it looks okay. And that's kind of what your firewall does. It checks to make sure, yeah, this generally matches what I'm looking for, but it doesn't div, uh, dive any deeper into it. It's not gonna be looking inside to see, is this actually a malicious act, or is this just normal traffic? So let's, let's take a malware scenario, right? So um, Bob goes home. He gives his laptop to his kids, as you know, no lawyer ever does. They're all PCI compliant and, and perfectly <laughs> secure. Um, so his kids pull up his laptop, play some, some dumb games on it, and get some malware on the device. Of course, this is not a scenario I've ever seen in my life. Um, so the next day, Bob brings his laptop in, he plugs it into the corporate network, and that malware that he got on his device last night reaches out, tries to figure out where it is, and as the malware kill chain goes, it I, it establishes its presence and then moves laterally in the network. So it'll figure out where it is and it'll try to find other resources that it can go attack. So it might see, hey, there's an SMB share open here. I'm gonna go through this firewall, through this permitted connection onto this SMB share, encrypt everything on the drive and hold a ransom. Or maybe you've got a CEO, and I'm sure this never happens, that wants RDP access from the internet without a VPN which of course is totally secure. Um, so you blast a hole in your firewall, you say, okay, so RDP, we'll put it even on a different port. We'll put it on like something weird that people won't usually look for. Uh, and we'll open up traffic. So RDP from anywhere into this one server. Naturally, there's things out there that just scan the internet for things like this, open ports that have things behind it. Um, and it will eventually get found. I've worked for companies that have had this exact scenario happen where they've had a random port open that went to RDP, that got infected by malware, that then encrypted all of their drives. And it's not a pleasant scenario, but it's one that's permitted through the firewall. It's a known, pro a known protocol going through an open port. So the firewall is great for being that security guard, for stopping the majority of the attacks because they're standard stuff. Uh, you can't, 
hit an SSH server if the SSH port isn't open to the public. You can harden it to an extent, but once you've got the ports, only the ports that you want open, how do you know if the traffic coming in and out of it is actually good traffic? How do you determine that there are no attacks within the traffic that you're expecting? So we want to capture what's called indicators of compromise. Um, so that's maybe uh, uh, some computer on your network is accessing a malicious domain, right? There's a list of domains that we have. There are known command and control servers. We can see if one of our computers is calling out to a known command and control server, that would be a good indicator of compromise. Um, we also want to look at malicious activity. Is there, uh, I don't know, some guy on the network who's just trying to log into an SSH server like 300 times a second? That's not normal. So we want, to, we want to find that traffic and identify it so that we get the indicator so we can look further into it, so we can do further investigation. But that indicator, that initial alert is what we're trying to get, and that's where the IDS comes in. So an IDS, what it does is it's a box that sits there, and it looks at all the traffic that's going past it, and it has a series of rules that it checks the traffic against. So one SSH packet goes by, that's fine. 300 SSH attempts go by, that starts to pick up on its alert. So it has these pre-programmed rules that we can set, we can configure, we can download a rule set, we can grab from uh, emerging threats, the ones that I'm gonna use here today. Um, you can get other rule sets for it, uh, but basically you download the rule set, it sits there, watches the traffic as it goes by, anything that looks malicious, it pops an alert. It'll tell you in one of its various ways it alerts, hey, something weird happened. I think you should look into this. It's and. Uh, there is a difference here between um, an IDS and IPS, right? We're, we're gonna set up an IDS today, and, and the difference is detection versus prevention. So an IDS, all it does, it watches traffic. If there's a problem, flags an alert, nothing else happens. It doesn't do anything else. It just tells you there's a problem, and it's up to you to go investigate. An IPS will actually sit there and block the traffic. So you'll put it in line, it'll be between the firewall and the rest of your segments. Anything that looks weird, it'll drop the traffic for you. And we'll, we'll get into some, some differences there. So some configuration deployment. So this is, this is typically how you deploy it, right? Is on the inside of your <coughs> firewall. So if you deploy it on the outside of your firewall, there's two problems you're gonna run into. First is NAT, right? Network access control, or network address translation, sorry. Um, when you move from the outside of the firewall to the inside of the firewall, typically, uh, the outside of the firewall will have a single IP address for all of your subnets behind it, but your internal subnets will have the private IPs associated with it. So if you put the firewall on the outside, all you're gonna see is that one IP address. And so tracking down which device is actually causing the problem is gonna be somewhat more challenging. But if you put it on the inside, you'll get the private IP address associated with that traffic. So you'll be able to quickly identify, oh, this came from this device in this subnet. Or at the very least, this is the subnet that it came from if you've got DHCP and a bunch of devices constantly connecting and disconnecting. The other problem is if you put it on the outside, it's gonna pick up on all the stuff your firewall already blocks. I honestly don't care if there's an SSH brute force attack happening against a closed SSH port. It doesn't matter to me. It's not something that I care about. It's gonna flag an alert that I have to then go investigate and spend resources to figure out if that's a problem. But if I put it on the inside, all that traffic's already blocked. I don't have to worry about it. I'm only getting things that actually matter to my network. So there's, there's two ways to do uh, this deployment strategy, by the way. The first is a tap. Do I have a picture? I have a picture. So a tap is a physical device that you put on the network, uh, on the network cable between your firewall and the rest of your network. So what this does is every packet that comes across, it permits it straight through, doesn't do anything to it, but sends a copy off to the IDS. So think of it as just a, a big photocopy, right? Everything passing through it, nothing happens, it just gets a copy off of the IDS. There's no actual connectivity through it. So if you do a tap, or if you do any of these options really, you have to remember, you have to have one plug for the tap and one plug for actual communications to the server, because the tap does, is not two ways. Your other option is a, if it'll load, is a span session. So uh, a lot of switches like Cisco gear, um, I think Ubiquity does this as well, uh, gives you the option of mirror ports. So if you have uh, one port that's just for the firewall, right, uh, and that's the inside of the firewall it's hitting, you can mirror everything that's going on in that port and output it to a different one. So that's great, because that means it, you don't have to buy anything else. The gear's already there. You can easily and quickly deploy it. The problem with the span session is the additional overhead on the device. 
So if you have all this traffic going on, that's additional overhead that the CPU has to process. The ASIC is taking that much more time to, to handle it, and it can cause some reliability issues. So generally, I'd say TAP is the way to go. Um, span session, if you're looking for something for a little while, that's fine, but if you're relying on it in production, that's probably a bad idea. So uh, another consideration is throughput, right? So uh, when we're talking about 100 megabit ports, for example, Right, so faster Ethernet ports. It's 100 megabits each way. So if I have a 100 megabit port that I'm mirroring, or that I want to capture all the traffic for, keep in mind that I capture traffic to it, and I capture traffic from it. So that's not 100 megabits per second, that's 200 megabits per second maximum that I'm getting through that port. Is everyone following? Cool. So when you're doing uh, considerations like this, right, you have to remember, if you're mirroring a fast Ethernet port, I need a gigabit port. If I'm mirroring a gigabit port, I need a 10 gig port. If I need whatever I'm mirroring, I need more bandwidth than that port has available. So it might be a good idea if you have just gigabit Ethernet ports, maybe just your port you're mirroring only is fast Ethernet. You can hard set it to do that and downgrade it, which isn't a great idea, but it, it'll get you up and running. Um, and especially for an IPS, when we talk about throughput, one of our considerations is overhead on the device as well. So IDS, it's offline. It's not real time. I don't care if my IDS is five or so packets behind. It can catch up. It can bump. If my IPS is behind, I start to get jitter. So uh, especially in VoIP sessions, uh, voice over IP, anything more than 30-ish milliseconds of delay is going to get you jitter on the line, which is bad voice connections, bad quality it's not gonna be good. Um, so when you put an IPS in there and you have the traffic passing directly through the device so that it can, it can drop the traffic like we were talking about, um, one of the considerations is you usually cut the throughput of the device in half. So if it's a device that's capable of passing a gigabit of traffic per second, now it's only capable of 500 meg. And that's mainly because of the overhead on the CPU that it just takes that much time to process the packet before it goes out again. So if you're thinking that you're gonna put an IPS and it's gonna be gigabit and it's gonna be just fine, you just gotta remember that CPU overhead that you're adding to the, the network. Uh, and like I said, uh, on the taps and the span session, uh, reliability is a huge problem, right? So on the span session, reliability is an issue. Uh, with the overhead on a tap, typically they're designed to fail open, um, especially optical taps. So if you're doing a fiber connection, right, it's just light passing through. So usually it's just a prism that is taking that light, redirecting it to a tap, and then siphoning it off. So if that doesn't get power, it doesn't care. It's a physical device. It's still gonna pass traffic. But if you have, for example, uh, an ethernet, uh, just a, a copper ethernet device, right, that's your tap, if that loses power, then your whole network goes down. So you have to consider reliability, uh, failover, um, all these things come into, come into plan when you're designing a good system. So having redundancy, having two links coming into the firewall, having multiple taps so in case one fails, the other picks up, uh, are all things you should be thinking about and making sure you have built into your system. Uh, and of course complexity, right? So with an IPS, you're probably going to have to replace some of your, your existing infrastructure. Uh, and we'll talk about this in a second when we get to embedded firewalls, but there usually is additional work you have to do when you're doing an IPS. With an IDS, you just drop it in place. You just do a tap, Siphon it off, it'll start working. Not a whole lot of configuration versus an IPS pretty, uh, is, it requires some tuning, uh, requires some uh, work to put in place in the on the front end, uh, and will take additional time and resources. So like I said, this is, this is a typical deployment. So you've got your firewall that feeds to the IDS, the IDS, uh, or the tap rather. The tap is sending a copy to the IDS for processing offline, and then everything else is flowing straight through to the servers. So for example, if I've got uh, one of my users is trying to attack one of my internal servers, right? So that traffic goes up through the firewall because it has to go through to a different segment. So it'll go up through the firewall, through the tap, and it'll come back through the tap to the server. So I got it twice. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, this will capture all your traffic. This will make sure that everything's working properly. Uh, this is the right way to do IDS deployment. So here's the bigger question, right? If you're trying to look for a solution for your environment, you're trying to look for a solution for your company or your home or whatever it is, do you build it or do you buy, buy it from a vendor? 
Um, Off-the-shelf solutions are great, but is it the right one? So there's, there's a couple options here. Um, the first one is an enhanced firewall. Um, typically, there's, Sophos is my favorite just because it's, it's a good, cheap device that actually has good support. It has a pretty well-integrated platform for it. It's, it's got a good dashboard. Uh, the rule set's okay. Um, Ubiquity is another option that has some IPS functionality built into it. Uh, Fortinet, Palo Alto, all these devices, all these firewall companies are really moving towards having a built-in IPS functionality inside the firewall, which is great because you deploy one device and you have your firewall, your IDS, your reporting, everything is built into it. It's great, it's expensive, <laughs> and if you have uh, an existing firewall, like you've got a Cisco ASA sitting on the, on the network right now, you're gonna have to replace it. So you have to consider the cost of replacing that device, the cost of the time and effort to get that re-engineered so the rules are, are correct to test and develop, uh, and then you have to figure out how you're gonna monitor, and there's a lot of extra work that goes into it. So it's a great option. It's a plug and play replacement. It's a little expensive, and it takes some time, but it's a good option. And the other, uh, like I was saying with the IPS, it cuts your throughput in half. So if you've got a gigabit device, now you only got 500 megs. So if you are looking for high speed, low latency, this is probably not a good option. So let's go with an actual IDS. So Alert Logic is a fantastic company. I think they're based out of Houston. Um, they, I've deployed, again, more of these devices than I can count. Um, Alert Logic is basically, you give them an IP address, they give you a box, you plug it in, and you're done. Um, it will auto-configure, it'll have the latest rule sets, it's got a SOC team sitting behind it, the Security Operations Center uh, team that will look at your alerts and actually do all the work for you. They'll tell you, hey, we saw this thing, here's all the traces of it, here's Woo! what it actually did. Exactly, it's great, <laughs> massively expensive. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's a black box. It doesn't give you a lot of monitoring out of it. Uh, you, it has a great dashboard to, to manage it. Um, but again, it's a black box and it's expensive. So it might not be a great option for people trying to do this for the first time. So if you're trying to initially deploy an IDS and you just get your feet wet and see what's the, what the deal is, what's going on, it's a large investment. Which brings me to option number three. So if you build it, it's gonna be cheap. It's gonna be dirt cheap. Like you got a spare server lying around, you're done. Um, the, all the tools are free and open source. Uh, the rule sets you can get for free. It's, uh, I think the one I just did is a $400 per year subscription for the rule set and that's the only real cost that it has other than space and power in their data center. So the only real cost there is space and power and employee time to implement it. So if you've got someone who's done this before, it's nice and quick. And hopefully by the end of this talk, all you guys will be able to do this as well. Uh, and I'll put my notes online for you, for you to crib off of the, the commands for it as well. Um, what I like about this option, especially for new builds, is it gives you the ability to put all the infrastructure in place. So even if you go the build your own route, right, you still gotta put the tap in place. You still have to have the network architecture correct. You still have to have um, the ability to respond to alerts. You've got like 90% of the infrastructure to support an IDS deployment uh, of something like Alert Project or, or some other IDS. You just don't have that big, fancy, shiny IDS. You're doing it all yourself. So if you wanted to swap it out and upgrade to something like Alert Logic or, or Sophos or something else in the future, you pull it out, put the new one in, and you're done. There's no additional work to do. So that's why I like this option as a good first step. It's, it's cheap, it's easy to deploy, you understand what's going on in it. Um, and it gives you the ability to upgrade in the future. So let's talk about how you actually do an IDS deployment. So we're, we've talked about how it works in the overall architecture, right? You've got a tap that's feeding a server of some sort that does something, and that gets you an alert. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna start with uh, a pre-configured, uh, not, not pre-configured, but a pre-installed uh, Fedora, Fedora 28 server. Um, so all I've done uh, is install the packages that I'll show you in a second. Uh, from there, it's, we're gonna edit the config file uh, and we're gonna download some, some packages for it and we'll be done. So Suricata, so let's, let's talk for a second. There's two um, competing, not necessarily competing, but two uh, engines that people use. It's either Snort or it's Suricata. So Snort has been around for ages. Um, it's 
a good, reliable engine that will process packets and give you alerts based on a rule set. It's exactly what you want, but it's not multi-thread. So in order to process large amounts of packets, you need to spawn additional uh, uh, additional systems, or sorry, additional processes for it, which is where Suricata comes in. Suricata is multi-threaded. Suricata is built for speed and built for efficiency. It is the upgraded, better version of Sort. It takes the same rule sets. It has the same outputs. It has the same formats. Does basically the same thing. So much better. It is multi-threaded from the beginning. It'll auto-spawn instances based on what you need and what your uh, what your hardware will support. So I very much recommend going with Suricata. <coughs> also, it's a package you can download from Fedora, so you don't actually have to compile it from source, which is great. Um, the rule set that I use, like I said, emerging threats, there's a bunch of, um, there's a bunch of rule sets out there uh, that you can download from various people. That some charge for it, some don't. Uh, emerging threats has an open and free rule set that you can go download, and we'll show you how to download that today in this, in this version. Um, so if you're just starting out, it's a great start. They have for that $400 a year fee uh, a version of the Emerging Threats rule set that is updated a little quicker and has a little bit more juice to it. Um, so if you want to put this in production and want to move from concept to reality with it, that would be my recommendation to go do that as well. Uh, and it's pretty much just as easy to, to download those rule sets as well. So step one is install Fedora server. I'm not going to do that today because that <laughs> takes a while. Um, update all your packages, so sudo yum update. Um, the dash fly is always do yes for commands. I like that one. Um, once you've got an updated running Fedora server, this is it. That's it. That's literally installing Suricata. You're done. Um, so so you can install Suricata. It's a package. It's pre-configured. The, uh, the RPM will automatically uh, maintain it for you. Uh, you don't have to worry about it updating. Just whenever you do your updates, it'll pull down the latest version if it gets updated. It's great. Let's talk about configuration. So there's two, uh, there's two inputs to Suricata and about three outputs we're gonna, we're gonna touch on. So the first input is called Suricata.yaml. So it is a 1,854 line formatted configuration file, uh, which is a bit of a beast. Um, the good news is that pretty much 90% of what you're gonna need ever is in the first five to 10% of that file. You're not gonna need to touch anything else on it. And I'll show you in just a second. Um, most of the defaults are fine. This is pretty much what I do uh, in terms of updates. So we're going to um, we're going to disable the stats, disable fast, enable Eve, uh, and disable all non-logging. Um, I, I will make a note here. So the default file assumes that uh, all your RFC 1919 uh, address space, so the 192.168. whatever address and the 10 dot whatever addresses, it assumes that all those are your internal behind the firewall nets and that anything else is public. So it'll naturally assume that all your internal networks are your source and your external networks are your destination. That's a concept that the rules use. Uh, if you have like someone from the outside attacking you on SSH, it'll say inbound attack from the outside. It'll give you that extra context. Uh, and a lot of the rules will also work based on if it's attacking different segments. There's a lot of stuff in the back end, but just to let you know, there is that assumption that your 1919 space is all internal. So let's go take a look at this. Uh, Etsy, Suricata, oh. And it's gonna ask me for this. Okay, so this is what the Suricata.yaml looks like. It's, it's a text file, that's all it is. It's not that scary, it's not that bad. So this first part, which you're seeing, is literally what I just said. It's assuming that all your internal 1919 space is your home nets, and anything external is anything else. If you have a different setup, if you're using public space for your uh, IP addresses in your network, for example, uh, I know there's a, a number of companies that do that just for interoperability with different VPNs, you can set it here, and it's quick and easy to do, and, and all, do, all you need to do is just restart the engine, it'll update it with new IP addresses. So we're gonna skip a lot of this. Um, section two here is all about rules. So the nice thing about Suricata is by default, it assumes you're using the emergent threats rule set. So it'll automatically have in the file, I'm gonna look for all, this, all the emerging threats rules. I think that he's gone ahead and downloaded it, so I'm just gonna include it by default. 
It's not included in the package. You still have to download it, but it'll assume that they're there. So you don't have to add, you don't have to add any of the uh, rule files in here. It just automatically works. If you do your own um, rule file, if you have some unique rules that you want to do for your own network, um, if you have some application running on a weird port that you really want to monitor, or you just don't want anything coming from this one network, and you want, want to alert when that happens, you put in a custom rule, this is where you would add that line. So all you do is pop a new line, dash, space, and whatever that file name is in the slash Etsy slash rules folder. It, it goes on for a bit. Okay, so outputs. So we've got, we've got a good idea of how it gets its input, right? It comes from, comes from the tap, it watches the traffic, it does things, and then it tells you, but how do you want it to tell you what's going on? There's different formats, different options. So uh, can I, I think I'm gonna skip ahead. So like I said, Etsy, uh, uh, slash, Etsy slash server rules, slash rules is where you get that. Um, so we'll, we'll skip ahead a little bit to this. So there's options for how to get the rule, how to get the alerts out. So circado.log is the first place. And all this does is it logs normal messages. It's, it's the equivalent of like the system log. Um, so it'll tell you when it starts, how many threads are starting, if there's any errors, if it comes up with any problems, whatever's going on, will be in this thing. So as you can see, that's uh, an example of things that will be in there. Like I didn't have, uh, I didn't have the rule set up properly, so it gave me an alert. It's good for debugging. Fast.log is a great lightweight logging option. All it does is it tells you, hey, something happened. Here's the source, here's the destination, here's the ports if applicable, here's the rule it matched, have fun. That's it. It's not a lot. It's not a lot of information, not a lot of detail, but it is lightning fast uh, and it's very lightweight. It doesn't take up a lot of disk space, so you'll be able to get it out pretty quick. Eve.json is by far my favorite way to log out of Suricata. So if anyone's familiar with JSON formatted files, um, it is a JSON formatted file. And for those who aren't familiar, um, basically it's a, a structure that gives you all the information in uh, pre-named fields. So for example, up at the top gives me a timestamp. I got the timestamp field, it'll always tell me what the field is. I don't have to go guessing what the structure or the schema looks like, it's just always there. Um, in here, what I have set up is it not only gives me the alert, not only gives me the header of the packet, it not only gives me the first four kilobytes of the packet data itself, it'll also give me a lot more detail. For example, if I have um, five flows enabled. So flows is, uh, Circon outputs alerts is, hey, something weird happened. You can also output flows. Flows are just, hey, I saw some traffic from this place to this place on this port. That's all it is. So if I want to go back and look at the specific flow and when that happened and a lot more information about it, Suricata can tell me and link it in this format. There's a lot more things you can do in here, uh, a lot more information you can put in, but this is my default uh, for what I do. Um, the last version of outputs, and this is a little bit more advanced and we're not going to touch on it here, is the binary, uh, Unified 2 binary. Um, so if you thought fast.log was fast, this is even faster. Um, basically this is just outputting the raw information straight to a file. Um, it's not queue and readable, which is why I don't like it that much. Um, it can be picked up by things like Barnyard 2 is a good program that will spool this and output it to MySQL and all that stuff. We're not gonna talk about that here today. Uh, just know that that's an option if you need more, if you need to dump directly to MySQL, if you're doing other stuff, that's how it works. And it is faster than fast.log. Okay, so let's go back here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to disable fast because it doesn't really give me a lot of information. I don't see a lot of usefulness out of it, especially when I'm already getting it in you. So I'm going to just set that to no. Eve. Eve is enabled by default, which is great, but it doesn't give me everything I need. So uh, I'm going to turn on um, alert. So a lot of these things are commented out because it's trying to be as fast as possible. It's trying to give you an optimized version. So we're going to turn on packet or payloads. So this is going to give you an output of the payload that's in the packet. So you can start seeing if it was an SQL injection, for example, you'll be able to see what the SQL command or the SQL request was uh, in the packet payload. Buffer size. 
Uh, I like to set it to four kilobytes. Otherwise, it's just gonna give you the whole thing. That's gonna be huge. Um, you can set it to more, you can set it to less. You can tune it to what you need. The first 4K gives you um, the HTTP request and the preamble, uh, as well as pretty much enough of the actual packet to give you an idea of what's going on. Payload printable. Um, this one, come back here. So payload printable, normally it'll give you the payload in base 64 encoded. Uh, what that means, it's, it's not human readable, but it's a more compact size. It's a, a faster way of giving you the payload, uh, as well as it, it, um, uh, it doesn't do anything weird if you have this running to MySQL. Um, you won't have any double SQL injections because um, it's still base64 encoded. I like to turn this on because I like to read it. Also, it'll give you both. Um, so in the eve.json, it'll give you both base64 in this version and it'll give you the output it in uh, human readable format. Packet. Yes, turn on the packet. Uh, that way you get the packet header. So you'll see everything about the frame, everything that happened on that level. And for those who just attended the previous talk in this room about uh, how Alice talks to Bob, this is how Alice talks to Bob. Um, HTTP body, yes. HTTP body printable, yes. This is the body of the request. Um, so also just turn this on. And that is pretty much that. Um, I don't do exported for. Uh, I don't have a lot of applications. So exported for is if you have um, a server that's responding for another server, if you have a load balance, or if you have something like that in your network, um, and it's not actually going to the server, it's passing through to something else, it'll be an exported for header on that. Um, this is, I know, getting into the weeds. Um, not necessarily something you have to turn on. If you have this turned off, you'll still be able to tell generally where it's coming from and where it's going. You might need to do a little bit more digging, but exported for just is more information than I think is, is really necessary on this. Um, the rest of this, I like to comment out. So if we turn off HTTP, that will stop doing every HTTP session. So all I want is alerts, right? I don't want to see every flow. I don't want to see every HTTP connection. I don't want to see every DNS connection. It'll do it by default, which is a huge file and a huge pain in the butt. But I don't want to see it, so I turn it off. So we're gonna turn off HTTP, we're gonna comment that out. I don't wanna see every DNS request, because I don't care who's going to what website, that's not for me. Um, if you want to see that, that's a good way, you can actually filter that and dump it to another file format, you can get a whole list of like what people are going to, you can have blacklist, it's great, but not in scope for what we're talking about today. TLS, turn that off. Files, it's not gonna reconstruct files for us this time, because that, again, is taking too much time. SMTP is mail information, uh, we're gonna turn that off. I don't care about SSH, and I don't care about stats. So stats is every so often, Suricata will dump, I've seen this many packets, it's been this long since I've been running, um, here's what's going on with stuff, right information, do not care. Uh, in my opinion, it's just dumping information to a file that I can get by logging in and looking at um, just Suricata directly. I, I don't really need that dumped in, but if you're handling a number of different systems, they're all running uh, Suricata, and you want to have like a central management, it might be a good idea to turn it on. I don't really need it, so I turn it off. Totals, threads, deltas. And this is the one that's gonna be the chattiest of all. So flow is, what I was talking about, is source and destination, that's all it is. So for every connection, every single one, flow will tell you where it came from, where it's going. That's a lot of data. Uh, I did a, a calculation on, so my current, current job I'm working, um, we turned it on for three days, it was about 20 million rows of information uh, just turning on flows. I don't need it. That's it, so unified alert. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Unified alert is off, HTTP log is off, TLS is off, DNS is off, PCAP is off, debug is off. The last one I'm gonna update is stats. So like I said, I don't care about stats. If you want a dedicated stats output, there is, uh, I think it's stats.log. So you can have it either dumped to, to eve.json, you can have it dumped to stats.log, you can have it output a couple different ways. Uh, this is a dedicated file just for that. All I see it doing is just tying up to that space. Um, so it's something I turn off. So enabled, no. Stop that. 
Okay. So other things you can do out of here, uh, you can send it to a Redis server, uh, you can send it to syslog, uh, you can send it to a whole bunch of places. But really, dumping it to the file is probably going to be the easiest way to pick it up, especially if you don't have um, a syslog destination set up and you're not really running that. If you just dump it to file, uh, there's other ways, other agents we can use to pick that information up. So that's, that's pretty much it. Everything after this, and there's a nice little warning up there, advanced configuration, you don't need to touch the seven. We're at the end of what we care about for this file. This is fine tuning, this is advanced stuff, uh, this is beginner's class here. We do not pass this point. Um, so at this point, what we've done, right, is we've set up our home next, we've told it what we care about, we've told it um, that we're gonna start running, we've told it uh, that it's gonna output to certain formats, pretty much we're done. That's it. So we save. That worked, right? Uh, yes, that did work. Okay. <clears throat> so, starting Zircon. So we've got our we've got our Zircon uh, YAML done. So that's configuration. It's all set. So, first, figure out what you actually want to monitor. So Circuit it can monitor one interface, it can monitor multiple interfaces. Multiple interfaces is still kind of in beta. It's not really supported just yet. Uh, I can tell you from my experience, I've been running Circuit on multiple interfaces for six months now. Uh, I haven't had any problems. Uh, all the test data I've run against it, it's picked up, hasn't had any issues. I think it's pretty stable. I would just warn you that um, if you're doing uh, multiple interface logging on Suricata. So you're, if you have not just one tap, but multiple taps, where it starts to get messed up is if you have the same traffic coming in on multiple places. So if you have just one tap, for example, let's, let's say you get a device that you just want to deploy, you just want to monitor one tap, but you don't want, really know which port's gonna be plugged in. You've got some dopey guy in the data center, he doesn't really know what he's doing. He's gonna plug the tap into something, you're just not sure which one turn on multiple interfaces, he can plug it in wherever he needs to, it doesn't really matter, and it'll just start monitoring. So that's usually my recommendation, is just set it to monitor everything, uh, and it'll be fine. You can even monitor uh, the port that it's getting management on, so if you're managing the report and it's monitoring it, it can do that as well. Uh, so if, for example, you're deploying it into your network, it can be a little honeypot, because then all the traffic that's going to it, it will also monitor. So things to think about. So all you do is you turn it on with sudo, um, you, you can set it to run for a specific user, but it needs admin credentials in order to put out the log file, and there's a bug for that. Um, so you start with sudo, uh, you tell it Circata, do on this interface with the dash i, uh, and then, okay, uh, and then it'll start running. So let's go ahead and get that going. Casinos, actually, what am I running on? Dash i, and I am e and P zero S three. Oh, <coughs> the security is so hard these days. One seventy three. Damn it! Sorry. Oh, that's my indentation. Damn it. <laughs> Why is it going to be so no, hard? You had it right. You just need to move the Hawaii Geo to come with it back. Gotcha. It's always something, isn't it? All right, I'm just going to turn a lot of this off uh, just to start it up. Okay, so with Circata running, you're gonna get some outputs. The outputs are all gonna be in var log, var log Circata. No, 
annoying. Anyway, so you're going to get your outputs, right? Your outputs are going to be eve.json, uh, fast.log, and circata.log. They're going to be the three that you get by default. We just turned on eve. Uh, so that's going to be logging eve. <clears throat> or that's going to be logging everything to eve in that extensible format that we saw before. So, congrats. Assuming that ran actually to run. Um, we have a running IDS, right? So that's how you do it. That's the file format. That's how you set it up. You've got a running IDS. Now what do you do? Because you've got this device that's logging to a file. It's logging locally to a file. How do you get that file? How do you get the file off the box? So you have to get that file off the box into some system where you're centrally locating everything. If you have six campuses that you're trying to do, that you're trying to get the information out of, how do you get that centralized? How do you analyze the threats and figure out the signal from the noise? How do you do an alert system? And how do you do the instant response based on that? So getting and storing alerts, there's options out there. Um, these are some of my recommendations. So Elk Stack is great. Sumo Logic is basically Elk Stack as a service. Um, so I would recommend going that direction. I've done that with a couple of installs. It's been fantastic. Um, you get 500 megabit, megabytes per day for free, which is great. Um, there's an agent that runs on the device. So you install an agent, you give it an API key with Sumo Logic. It'll pick up that file, it'll parse it in, and you'll be able to say, uh, you're gonna go in and parse that log file to give you different alerts. You can set schedule alerts so that if there's something um, that you're looking for, it'll automatically alert you in an email format. Um, there's a lot of things that Sumo Logic will do that are great. It's got a built-in, uh, not emerging threats, it's CrowdStrike. It works with CrowdStrike. It automatically does a lot of information based on the IP address that's coming in. Um, there's a lot of value add to Sumo Logic. Um, other things, there's a lot of alerts coming in. So if you have your own database, keep in mind, it's gonna be roughly 7,000 alerts per week per office is usually what I've seen. Um, so it's a lot. If you have multiple devices, it's gonna even be even more. For data centers, it can be even bigger than that. So keep in mind, you've gotta store all this data, you've gotta keep it in a format that you can actually search through, which is why Elk Stack is great, because it just extends. Uh, Sumo Logic is even better because you don't have to deal with it. Uh, and then log retention. So you've got all this data. Usually you're deploying an IDS for a reason. Um, it should be the basic building block of any security, but usually it's because you want to do uh, compliance of some sort for HIPAA, for PCI, for whatever. Um, some, some readings of HIPAA say that we have to keep this information for six years. It's a lot of time. So you not only have to now manage that data and analyze the data, you have to store it and log it. So where do you put that? How do you do it? How do you rotate that out to other things? So these are things you have to keep in mind, not within the scope of this discussion here. I'm just giving you the options of here's how you generally you can get it out. Analysis. So how do you analyze that, that information? How do you get alerts out of it? Uh, you need some sort of system. Like I said, Sumo Logic is great. Uh, this is one that my company built, that I designed, um, that will, you need to coordinate and correlate. <coughs> this came in to this IP address at this time from this location. How do you do that? How do you make that analysis happen? Um, you have to be the detective, the who, what, where, and why of what happened. You, your system needs to be able to do that and, and aggregate and give you results out. So it can't just be a flat database, there has to be something along with it. Um, you have options out there like Splunk, uh, there's other sim tools that'll do some of this. Um, but it, it's a uh, consideration that you don't just get the data, you need to be able to understand and analyze the data. And after that, you need to be able to do incident response. So once you have an alert, if you get the alert and you jump for joy that you actually got something, uh, and then sit there and like, okay, how do I do anything meaningful with this? That's where incident response starts. So you need to have a system where every alert must be actioned, right? So this, this is my recommendation is, if you don't have every alert actioned, you're gonna run into um, a situation where you're gonna lapse into complacency. You're just gonna be like, oh, whatever, that's, that's some weird alert, I don't have to deal with it because I don't need to action. So you want your system to only output alerts you care about, stuff that you're actually gonna do something about, interesting things. So you have to have your system designed to do that, and then from there, you need to contain the threat, investigate what happened, eradicate the threat, close the vulnerability, standard instant response stuff. So, uh, I'm getting the high sign from the back. Um, my company was designed, I'm gonna shamelessly plug, uh, our design is built basically to do all this stuff, except for instant response, in some cases, uh, for small to medium businesses. So we designed a system to do this. We, we use Suricata, a running version, um, 
We use Circata, we use a lot of these tools that we built ourselves. Um, I'm happy to give you a, a talk about it as well. Um, there's other options out there is what I'm saying. Like the easy part, the easy part is deploying the IDS device. The hard part is getting the alerts in, ingesting the data, doing the log retention, understanding what you're doing, getting the alerts out, sending it to the right places, that's the hard part. That's what we did, and we're, we're happy to share our information with you guys. Uh, but that's for another talk. So if you have any questions, I'm here. Otherwise, you've been great, and thank you so much. That was great. Thanks, Thanks guys.